So um, good afternoon, everyone, Distingu distinguished guests, colleagues and friends joining us here in person and on this kind of cold afternoon, a warm welcome to those joining us online. My name's Mary Keyes and I'm the director of the Law Futures Research Centre at Griffith University. With others, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today and to pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So in this session, we really turn our focus to the Asia Pacific quite strongly. We have two speakers and as for the rest of the sessions, each of them will speak for approximately 20 minutes and then we'll have um, quite a lot of time for discussion, comment and questions. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker for this session, Professor Jishun Zhu. Professor Zhu is a Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Bucknell University, which is in Pennsylvania. He's a specialist in Chinese politics and foreign policy, East Asian political economy, US Asian relations and international relations theory. He's very widely published and for details of his many books, you can refer to the conference program. He's currently a Fulbright scholar at Griffith University. And this afternoon, his topic is shifting global powers. What can and should Australia do if the US-China relationship intensifies? Please welcome Professor Zhu. Thank you, Professor Case. Thank you, Professor Sanford, for inviting me. Um, so uh, the, uh, the conference is about uh, US-Australia alliance, but I think China has been mentioned very frequently, right? <laughs> Perhaps more frequently than any other country. You know? So we'll talk about China and, <laughs> and China-related issues. Um, uh, some people say that uh, uh, China is the biggest challenge, right? Uh, but I think for me, perhaps the biggest challenge is to make sure that everybody will stay awake <laughs> after a long day, right? I, I try to do my best, okay. Um, so it's really a great, a great honor and pleasure to join this uh, list of distinguished scholars and practitioners uh, to talk about important issues about US-Australia alliance and Australian foreign policy, you know. I'm not really an ex expert on those topics, right? So uh, I'm just going to approach those issues uh, uh, you know, from, a, from a, 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 a China scholar, perhaps, and, uh, I, and I'm going to just share with you some initial observations. Um, by the way, I do not represent uh, any institution or program I'm associated with. These are all my personal views, okay? Um, I think we can all agree that U.S.-China competition is a defining theme of our time. Naturally, both uh, scholarly and policy attention has been focused on these two great powers, right? But what about those countries stuck in the middle, right? I think uh, uh, challenges facing uh, third parties and their policy options are clearly understudied. Uh, if U.S.-China rivalry intensifies, what can third parties, including Australia, do? Um, so that, I think that's a very interesting uh, policy question as well as a scholarly question, right? Um, I think, you know, th these countries have their own interests and agency, and their policy decisions not only affect themselves, but may also affect the cause and outcome of US-China competition. So I will make uh, three points today, right? I always make three points to make sure that my students can easily remember and take notes, right? Yeah. So first, uh, is uh, US-China rivalry will continue into the future, and we all need to face this reality. Second point, Australia is not alone in being stuck between a rock and hard place. And finally, can Australia enjoy good relations with both the United States and China? And further, can Australia actually do something more to perhaps uh, ease tensions between China and the United States? I think those are 
some of the questions we are all concerned about, right? Uh, my first point is about the US-China rivalry. Uh, I assume that uh, many of us here have watched the movie uh, The Wizard of Oz and enjoyed the music, right, over the Rambo, right? Uh, to, to, uh, to quote Dorothy in this uh, classic movie, when she was talking to her dog, Toto, she said, I quote, Toto, we are not in Kansas anymore, right? <laughs> Indeed, you know, the world is rapidly changing. We're not in the same place anymore. And the Western dominance of the world is coming to an end, and we all have to adjust to it. In the Indo-Pacific region, most countries in the, in the area actually depend on the United States for security. Meanwhile, most of them trade more with China than with anybody else. So you have this uh, uh, so-called dual-track political economic system, uh, or some people call it security economics uh, nexus, which makes it imperative for countries in the region to maintain good relations with both powers. It would be silly, actually, to side with uh, one power and, and alienate or even confront the other power. The fundamental policy of the United States is to maintain its global dominance and push back any challenges to its superpower status. On the other hand, of course, we know that China under Xi Jinping is actively pursuing the so-called Chinese dream to uh, rejuvenate the Chinese nation or to restore its uh, past glory. So in the process, actually, China is inevitably going to challenge the U.S. dominance. And I, I would argue that uh, this, this uh, uh, great power conflict is inherent and structural. And there's no way to avoid it. As a global economic power, China's national interests have grown beyond its uh, immediate neighborhood, expanding to uh, other parts of the world will be a logical next step for an ambitious power like China. Whether intentional or not, China will be in competition with the United States around the world for power and influence. We all know that the South Pacific region has become the latest arena for great power competition. The United States and Australia are alarmed by China's uh, recent infiltration into the region. Uh, traditionally, the uh, sphere, sphere of influence of Australia and the United States, right? But before we panic and overreact, we should ask ourselves several questions. Can a global power like China only operate in its immediate neighborhood? As Chinese power grows, isn't it expected to expand its trade and influence to different parts of the world. And when the United States and Australian warships roam around in the South China Sea or East China Sea in the name of freedom of navigation, why can't China even develop normal economic and security relations with countries in the South Pacific? And of course, we don't ask those questions often here in Australia or in the United States, right? When Western countries reached out and embraced China during the Cold War, that China was, more, was, was no more liberal or no less repressive than it is today. So obviously, it's, it is not just chi that China has changed. It's also that our perceptions and narratives about China in the West that have changed. Let's be frank. The Chinese Communist Party has a terrible reputation in many parts of the world now. But I don't think uh, it means that all the world's problems today are caused by the Communist Party of China. We all need to approach each other with some degree of humility and self-reflections. Some of my Australian friends claim that China is the biggest threat to Australia's national security. Well, as delegates from uh, several uh, smaller countries from a region, including uh, Fiji, for example, to the recently concluded Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, that they reminded us that the biggest national security threat to the South Pacific region is climate change. 
and the just concluded Pacific Islands Forum affirmed that message. Some people also asserted that China and the United States are each other's biggest threat. I totally disagree. I think for both the United States and China, the biggest threat comes from within. In America, democracy is under attack. Inflation, gun violence, racism, and divided society are just some of the major concerns of ordinary Americans, not external challenges from Russia or China or North Korea. In a recent poll, half of the Americans surveyed think America will not be a democracy in the future. In another poll conducted by the New York Times, the uh, only 13% of Americans voters, American voters said the nation was on the right track. So obviously, it's not a good time to promote American-style democracy in China now. And of course, in China, all the domestic problems are likely to converge in the next few months, uh, in the near future, especially before the uh, party congress, a slowing economy, uh, widespread grievances as a result of zero COVID policies, ethnic tensions, and potential power struggle within the party. They're going to uh, challenge the party's leadership and stability. The party uh, cares so much. So I would argue that the real danger here is that in both the United States and China is that the Chinese government or the US government may try to deflect internal problems, internal pressures by shifting attention to foreign affairs, thus creating tensions and even a crisis in the US-China relationship. And that danger is real. So the bottom line is the US-China relationship will not be smooth in the near future, especially uh, regarding the Taiwan issue, which has been mentioned many times. And we really have to be prepared for this uh, reality. That's my first point, kind of pessimistic, right? Uh, coming to my second point, uh, um, not sure whether I'll be more optimistic or not, but uh, uh, second point is about uh, the third parties uh, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a, this dual track structure in political economy in the world today. That is, the United States provides security uh, protection to most countries in the Indo-Pacific, and China is the largest trading, partners, uh, a trading partner of, of pretty much every country <laughs> in the region, right? Over 120 countries around the world. Uh, very few third parties would like to see tensions between the United States and China. Realistically, it's not in any country's interests to antagonize either superpower. The Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy is designed to compete with China and win that competition. Nothing is wrong with that, right, from the US perspective. Uh, Secretary of State Antony Brinken outlined the Biden administration's broad foreign policy agenda in March 2021. He said, I quote, our relationship with China will be competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be, unquote. And Blinken made another speech uh, about China, specifically, in May 2022, in which he used the three words to summarize US strategy towards China. Invest, align, and compete, uh, which sounds good to me, actually. Uh, so we should invest domestically, especially, uh, you know, infrastructure, education, healthcare, right? Uh, America is in, uh, so behind in those areas. Definitely we need to invest in those areas. Align, meaning uh, working together with allies and partners to deal with global challenges together, unlike what uh, Trump did unilaterally, uh, or just putting America first, right? Compete. Yes, we need to compete with China. So you hear a lot of uh, competition, right, uh, between China and the United States. I think competition is good, actually, right? I would argue that uh, healthy competition should be welcome. <laughs> because as they say, a riding tide will lift all boats, right? So uh, both the United States and China should welcome uh, healthy competition. But what I'm concerned is this zero-sum kind of competition, uh, which I think will lead to conflict 
and even confrontation. Uh, so it is interesting to compare and contrast how countries in the region have responded to the US-China competition. I think we all know that most countries in the region are engaged in these uh, uh, hedging strategies where they seek to balance relations with the United States and China uh, because of the you know, benefits that uh, derive from uh, maintaining good relations with both powers. Uh, but of course, not all countries look at China or even Russia through the same lens. <laughs> we have to remember that, right? Uh, just going to give uh, some examples, okay? Japan, due to its unresolved historical uh, uh, animosity and, and territorial dispute with China, is kind of expected to uh, uh, join this uh, US-led uh, campaign to counter or even contain China, right? And to some extent, actually, Japan has been even more active and enthusiastic in pursuing those policies to counter China. I mean, uh, this idea of uh, the free and open uh, Indo-Pacific, even the idea of Quad actually came from the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, right? Uh, Singapore, very interesting, a small nation uh, with uh, perhaps an outsized global influence has been explicit in rejecting to side with either power in the US-China rivalry. Singaporean leaders have repeatedly told their counterparts in the United States and China that Singapore will not choose sides. Don't force us to choose sides. We want to maintain good relations with both of you. And furthermore, they have encouraged both powers to talk to each other and resolve their differences peacefully and diplomatically. Overall, countries in the region are concerned about the, the prospect of US-China conflict and prefer to approach China cautiously. Uh, for example, uh, Indonesia's defense minister, uh, Subianto, said at uh, you know, this year's uh, Shangri-La dialogue, China has been a great civilization. They've been leaders of Asia for many thousands of years. We urge everybody to respect the rightful rise of China. Malaysia former uh, Prime Minister Mohamed uh, Mahathir also criticized the uh, US-led Indo-Pacific economic framework as an initiative intended to isolate China, saying, I quote, many countries recognize that this IPEF is not an economic grouping, but it is truly a political grouping, unquote. Now, Australia, right across the ditch, is an interesting case. I think Australia and New, uh, and New Zealand I mean, New Zealand, right? New Zealand and Australia have uh, many common interests, uh, especially in the uh, uh, South, South Pacific. And their foreign policies are almost uh, identical. Well, almost, <laughs> not uh, completely, right? New Zealand uh, seems least enthusiastic about containing China in the, in the group of five or five, five ISIS. Uh, and is uh, willing to take a more conciliatory approach towards China. The result is, of course, that New Zealand enjoys good relations with both the United States and China, and in particular, New Zealand and China trade remains strong. India is another interesting case. Uh, it's a major power in the region. It's a member of the Quad, well, obviously an anti-China group, right? But at the same time, India is also a member of BRICS <laughs> and Shanghai Cooperation Organization <laughs> in Central Asia, where both Russia and China play critical roles. So in other words, India has been trying to maintain good relations with all these powers, including Russia, China, and the United States. Now, outside the Indo-Pacific, US allies and partners have also tried very hard to manage re their relations with both powers. For example, Israel, obviously, uh, is heavily dependent on US uh, security protection, right? But uh, those of you who know a little bit of history, you know, uh, the Jews and Chinese have a pretty close relationship going back to history, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know? Uh, so the, today's Israel wants to maintain strong and dynamic relations with China. 
not just economic relations, but also political di diplomatic relations. And of course, uh, Israel has been under heavy pressure uh, from the United States to uh, kind of decouple uh, from China, right? And I think recently, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Alibaba, uh, Alibaba's office, research office in Israel uh, was closed. Uh, well, a lot of reasons, but the pressure from the United States uh, is one of them. So, so uh, in, in, in the minds of those who tend to view world politics as a zero-sum game, a war between China and the United States is inevitable. The truth is, though China is a peer competitor for the United States, the United States still needs to work with China in order to make progress on issues where there are common interests, such as climate change, global health, global development, and nuclear non-proliferation. So the challenge for current and future administrations uh, in the United States or elsewhere in dealing with China is to find the right mix of cooperation and confrontation, not just competition and confrontation. And we have not found that uh, fine balance yet. Uh, my third point, you know, specific about uh, Australia, can Australia enjoy good relations with both the United States and China? I think for third parties like Australia that are stuck uh, in this uh, great power rivalry, the simple question is, are they happy with the situation, with the status quo? If not, what can we do, right? I don't think Australia is happy with the situation, right? The tense relations with China and, and sometimes pressure from the United States. I understand, you know, people mentioned that the uh, foreign policy decisions uh, here are made in Canberra, not uh, uh, in, in Washington. Unlike uh, in Japan, some people say that uh, Japan's foreign policy actually is made in Washington, not in Tokyo, right? Uh, so when I hear that, uh, when I hear the phrase that China has changed, right? And there's no hope for an improvement of relations. I think such an assessment in Australia or in, in, in the West in general, lacks self-reflection and uh, dismisses the value and role of diplomacy. Um, it is very difficult, even politically incorrect nowadays, uh, to advocate friendly relations between the United States and China in Washington or Canberra. Uh, to be tough on China and, and demonize China on everything seems the right thing to do now. Unfortunately, uh, clear-headed clear, clear and moderate voices are not getting enough attention. And I consider myself uh, among those uh, clear-headed and moderate voices. And occasionally I got attacked in the United States for being kind of pro-China which I'm not, you know, I'm critical of Chinese policies, right? I just want to uh, provide uh, uh, a fuller picture to see how, uh, you know, how the same situation is viewed uh, outside the West, right? It is encouraging to note that many Australians are clear-minded. A recent poll by the Australia-China Relations Institute uh, in, in uh, Sydney, right? Uh, University of Technology Sydney, shows that the Australian public recognizes the current situation is, is not as one-sided as some would like to suggest. A clear majority of respondents in Australia, actually 38%, agree that the responsibility for improving the relationship between Australia and China lies with both countries. So we're not blaming China for everything, right? Um, Many blame the previous uh, Morrison government for the terrible state of Australia-China relations today. But if you look back, you know, earlier in his term, Morrison actually was deliberate in framing the relationship with China as partnership. Despite the disagreements, he said he was, quote, very committed to ensure uh, this, the differences, don't overtake the rest of the relationship. So Morrison was careful to maintain some distance uh, 
uh, between his government's position on China and that of the Trump administration. When meeting with uh, Trump in the Oval Office in September 2019, Morrison said, we have a comprehensive strategic partnership with China. We work well with China. We have a great relationship with China. Unquote. And this was in, obviously in, uh, in contrast to, uh, to Trump's confrontation approach and the trade war he launched with China. Uh, I heard people mentioning uh, fear as a factor uh, behind Australia's foreign policy, especially its policy towards China, right? Uh, I believe uh, David uh, uh, Brophy recently published a book uh, titled China Panic. Uh, he uh, traced uh, Australia's China Panic to uh, 2017. Uh, he said Prime Minister Malcolm uh, Turnbull uh, made, a, made a speech in late 2017 in which he said, the Australian people have stood up. I don't know how many people in this audience understand the, the, <laughs> the political <laughs> significance of that uh, phrase, right? The Australian people have stood up. That was the uh, direct quote from Mao, actually. When Mao founded the People's Republic uh, in uh, October 1949, he said, the Chinese people have stood up. Referring to uh, China becoming an independent state after 100 years of uh, humiliation by the West. So when you say the Australian people have stood up in Chinese, you know, it's a provocation. You know? uh, again, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, if you don't understand that context, probably you don't think that's a big deal, right? But it is viewed in China as a provocation. Uh, indeed, you know, uh, it was also mentioned earlier today, right, the, this public call for COVID-19 investigation uh, really led the, to the tensions uh, between the two countries. But I also want to mention that uh, the Australian government decided to ban Huawei in Australia's 5G network. That also exacerbated uh, the distrust between China and Australia. <laughs> and the Australian government did that even before Trump. <laughs> Think about it. So uh, uh, there's, uh, there's um, no doubt that uh, US-Australia uh, alliance is the pillar of Australia's uh, foreign policy. And I, I think the two countries will do our utmost to defend the current international system maintained by the West. Uh, however, I would also argue that Australia has its own <laughs> interests and agency, and I don't think Australians like to be, you know, to be called America's deputy sheriff, right? Uh, sorry to offend uh, my friends here. Uh, while pre preserving uh, the uh, US-Australia alliance, can Australia take somewhat different approach from this confrontational uh, policy that started uh, with the Trump administration, but also largely inherited by the Biden administration. I think in history, uh, Australia made some independent but wise decisions, right? Uh, you know, uh, 1971, uh, when opposition leader then uh, uh, Whitman uh, was, uh, was in China, 1971. Actually, it was about the same time when Henry Kissinger was secretly visiting uh, uh, Beijing, right? Uh, the story goes like this, actually. Um, after Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai uh, met with uh, uh, Mr. Whitman, Whitlam, you know, uh, Zhou Enlai said, uh, well, nice meeting you. Thank you for coming to China, right? I got another meeting, uh, uh, you know, so see you soon, right? So he <laughs> went to the next room talking to Kissinger, who was waiting for him. In the next room. But of course, uh, uh, Ms. Whitlam did not know that uh, Kissinger was just waiting next, next door. Right? Anyway, um, uh, when uh, Whitlam uh, uh, came to power, you know, he uh, normalized relations with China in December 1972, ahead of the United States, ahead of Japan. <laughs> that was a, a wise and independent decision made by Australia, right? Also, another example, you know, 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2015, uh, China established this new bank, right, called Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. Uh, for some reason, the United States uh, strongly opposed it, still opposed it, I guess, today, right, and uh, exercised some pressures on U.S. allies not to join the AIIB. Of course, we all know that uh, Australia, together with some, uh, most of the US, other U.S. allies, joined the bank, actually, as founding members, right, and I would argue that's another uh, example of this independent and wise decision, uh, keeping some distance uh, 
from uh, from uh, the approach of the United States that uh, Australia thinks does not serve U.S. In uh, America, uh, Australia interests. Um, to be frank, I think uh, the current U.S. policy towards China is likely to lead to more tensions for Asia. It is aimed at countering China and dividing the region into opposite camps. We had this discussion earlier about this dichotomy of democracy versus uh, autocracy. Again, not many countries in the region <laughs> look at it that way. Uh, I think you know this uh, former Prime Minister of Singapore, uh, Gao, said recently that we don't look at the U.S.-China competition that way. Uh, you know, autocracy versus uh, democracy. We view it as a competition between different governance models. And to many developing countries, whether you like it or not, the Chinese model is attractive, right? And we should respect that. And it's also interesting to note that. Uh, uh, many Western countries, you know, uh, promote democracy domestically at home, right? We, we, we advocate, you know, democracy, diversity at home, right? But in, in international affairs, we don't do that. We only think that uh, one model is the only model, right? This Western-led uh, democracy is the only model for managing international affairs. Where's that democracy in international affairs? We cannot just only practice democracy domestically, not internationally, right? So we need democracy, diversity. Uh, uh, both domestically and internationally. I mean, if we are so confident of democracy, let democracy compete with China's model. And whichever model works, it will win out. If we are fearful of Chinese model, it shows me, to me, that uh, we don't feel secure about our, ourselves, about our own model. So, um, can Australia, as a respected middle power that has huge stakes in maintaining strong relations with both the United States and China, do something more positive to help ease tensions between the two powers? Um, I know because I keep in touch with uh, my colleagues in China. You know, many Chinese are disappointed that Australia seems to be following the United States uncritically, uh, just like Japan, right? Uh, I mean, they. they in their view, you know, maybe it's understandable, right? Uh, because, uh, because of historic issues, maybe uh, Japan does not like to see a prosperous and, and a powerful China, right? But why Australia? Uh, there are no fundamental problems between Australia and China. And this notion that uh, China is a threat to Australia does not resonate in China at all. <laughs> and uh, many Chinese would consider that as an outlandish idea, right? So uh, I'm sure people here will ask, what about the Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong, right? Oh, yes, definitely. I think China is shooting itself in the foot on those issues, right? There's no doubt, you know, uh, China has human rights issues. But on the other hand, you know, I'm not defending a, a Chinese policy. But on the other hand, I would argue that uh, we need to have a holistic view of human rights issues in China. And to uh, note the progress China has made over the years, over the decades. For example, lifting 800 million people out of poverty, is that a human rights achievement? Uh, investing globally, helping many developing countries to develop, is that a human rights achievement? Uh, trading with over 120 countries, uh, as, as the largest trading partner of over 120 countries, helping those countries to grow, uh, is China contributing to global growth? Now, our media in the West don't cover those kind of stories, and popular opinions are often shaped by our media, which tends to focus on <laughs> the dark side of China, right? And we all know that the uh, uh, dark side of, the chi of China, of Chinese society. But I think the question is, do you think confrontation is a better approach than engagement to shape China's policies, to shape China's human rights conditions. I think values are important, but do we want to define 
Australia-China relations purely from the human rights perspective? Or is it, is the Australia-China relationship, or for that matter, is the US-China relationship just about human rights? Just remember, Xi Jinping, President of China, was warmly welcomed in Australia in 2015. Now, how much has he changed since then? I would argue he has not changed much, or China has not really changed much. The problems, the complaints we have with, with Xi or China today have existed long ago, before, 19, uh, before 2015, right? Uh, so again, the fundamental, fundamental question here is, you know, is confrontation a better approach than engagement when dealing with China? It is encouraging that Australia-China relations have started to improve after Prime Minister Albanese took office. I think we all know that the defense ministers and foreign ministers from both countries have met so far. Uh, both sides seem ready to reset relationship. But I want to caution you also, you know, I think the two governments are ready to uh, turn the page and improve relations, but I don't think our, you know, the, the two societies, or especially the media here, is ready, you know. Uh, maybe that's also because of cultural differences, right? Uh, I remember, you know, when uh, Penny Wong was meeting uh, with uh, her counterpart, Wang Yi, uh, during the recent, uh, you know, G20 foreign ministers meeting, right, in Bali, Indonesia. You know, Wang Yi, you know, proposed several points, you know, uh, in which he expressed the Chinese wish, right? Well, we, we hope that, you know, we can work on those areas. Uh, I think one of them is that uh, uh, Wang Yi says that we hope that uh, uh, Australia will treat China as as uh, opportunity, not as a threat, right? So, uh, but the media here cover the story as if Wang Yi presented Penny Wang with a list of four demands, <laughs> which is totally untrue if you understand the, the context and the uh, linguistics here, right? So I know time is up, but uh, finally, just. Uh, 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 Allow me to give uh, one, one minute, okay. So I think broadly speaking, in terms of how third parties are reacting to US-China rivalry, I think there are two models, broadly speaking, right? Japan model or the Singapore model, right? Uh, Japan seems to be the most ardent follower of US foreign policy, and it sometimes appears even ahead of the United States in developing policies to counter China, right? Uh, essentially adding fuel to the fire, I believe. Singapore, on the other hand, has maintained good relations with both powers and encouraged them to settle the disputes uh, peacefully. So I think the, the title of our conference in you know, Australia, Autonomy and American, uh, uh, American Alliance, 80 years on, uh, it's quite fitting, you know. Um, I think, uh, you know, the American-Australia Alliance is strong and should remain strong. But at the same time, I think Australia has its own interests that may not necessarily overlap with those of the United States. So Australia should perhaps strive for some autonomy from the uh, alliance for its own national interests. And better yet, as um, a respected middle power, Australia can perhaps bridge the gap between the United States and China and help to build a better world for all. And maybe perhaps, uh, finally I would like perhaps propose that uh, uh, Australia can work with uh, other countries in a similar situation and form a third party alliance or maybe something called middle power alliance to help ease tensions and encourage the United States and China to focus on areas of common interests instead of being obsessed with the zero-sum competition. And of course, that is a very tall order. I will stop here. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for a fascinating and um, clear-minded and moderate perspective this afternoon. It was really interesting. Um, our next speaker is Sonia Arakal, and um, she is a policy fellow at the Perth US Asia Centre, where she directs the centre's India programs and supports policy development through publication and advisory work. Her foreign policy commentary has been featured in the local and international press, including in The Australian and The Age. And today she's going to be speaking about India's approach to strategic autonomy, lessons for Australia. Thank you, Sonia.
Thank you, everyone. And I am so glad to have this opportunity to address you after we've heard from the doyens of Australian and international foreign policy. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Sanford for inviting me. And I'd note I'm here in lieu of my colleague, Hayley Channer, Senior Policy Fellow, who is also currently undertaking a Fulbright at the Hudson Institute in Washington. So today, I hope to add um, to the discussion as a relative newcomer to the world of foreign policy. I've set myself the challenge of discussing strategic autonomy in the Alliance Lessons from India. Australia is a country so different in scale, demography, history, and growth trajectory. You might be thinking, what part of Indian foreign policy, India, who is a nuclear armed power that is the third largest military spender and the fifth largest economy, what could we have to learn from, from them, given the differences? Well, you'd be right, tactically, not much. But if we step back, we may find that the principles driving India's foreign policy settings are salient to our own, and indeed, to our approach to the alliance. Considering lessons from India um, is a worthwhile exercise, because in the Indo-Pacific, we cannot limit ourselves to studying only the apex of the ecosystem, China and the US. As Professor Zhu noted, um, we benefit from observing how our neighbours are responding and what of their response is relevant to our own. So today, I'm going to argue that there are three lessons we can draw from India's approach to strategic autonomy. Firstly, that we do not need to be constrained by default foreign policy settings made for a different era. As India has developed a backup plan to their strategy of non-alignment, so should Australia have a plan B to the alliance. Secondly, that having a plan B doesn't have to be synonymous with accepting the Chinese challenge in the region. India resists a G2 framing of the world, and Australia too should find a third way of conceptualizing a new order in the Indo-Pacific. Lastly, the huge population of young people in India is relevant to its foreign policy. And Australia too should note that the emerging millennial generation can bring new imaginings to our foreign policy settings. They are more open to a plan B or doing things in a third way. What do these lessons mean in practice? They do not mean walking away from the US-Australia alliance, our plan A. But it does mean changing the way we think about the alliance in the long term and demanding more from the alliance in the short term. So to the first point, both India and Australia are caught by their post-World War foreign policy choices. These were choices determined in part by their colonial history. For India, it is the post-colonial commitment to non -aligned, the non-aligned movement. For Australia, it is the model of a great and powerful ally, first the British and now the Americans. However, the contemporary setting has challenged both these countries and the utility of these default settings. Both India and Australia are coming to the terms with the fact that these default settings may not be the best way to navigate great power rivalry in the Indo-Pacific. The non-alignment strategy of, India, of India's relations with major powers um, was a philosophy that simply says that they will not formally align with or against major power blocks. But today, in the face of a growing threat perception of China, India realizes it needs friends. It is realizing that sticking to its default setting of a non-aligned foreign policy constrains their autonomy. That if military clashes escalates on their border in the way it did in the Galwan Valley in 2020, India will need friends both on its borders and in its Indian Ocean territories. It needs a plan B. Today, there's broad consensus in New Delhi that the non-aligned doctrine has outlived its purpose. And what we are seeing is that it has been succeeded by this concept of strategic autonomy. Strategic autonomy through a multi-alignment strategy to maximize India's national power and build strategic relationships with countries that have, it may have previously had adversarial relationships with. Countries like Russia, the US, China, even Saudi Arabia and Iran. This has resulted in a growing alignment with, between India and the US. For example, India's joining of the Quad, or the fact that they have voted with the Five Eyes on key UN resolutions. 
There's also been a diversification of arms imports um, and with a greater reliance on arm um, exporters like the US and Philippines. India's approach to multi-alignment means that it is being courted by all sides of an increasingly polarized international system. What's notable here is that in the face of a changing threat perception in the Indo-Pacific, India's foreign policy has not remained stagnant or stayed trapped in its post-Cold War settings. India has demonstrated a strategic flexibility and is open to realigning its posture when necessary. Turning now to Australia. The Australia-US alliance is the foundation of Australian foreign policy and our default settings in securing our place in the region. However, we are increasingly anxious about the reliability of the US in our region. We are grappling with the fact that the US is changing as much as China is. Whether it is avoiding intervention in Syria, withdrawing from Afghanistan, not putting on boots on the ground in Ukraine, or withdrawing from the TPP, we must plan for the fact that the US might not always be in the Indo-Pacific region in the way we want them to be, while doing everything we can to make sure they are. The Trump administration relationship to gun control, reproductive rights, has brought to bear that we may not always take for granted that Australia and America share the same values. Like being non-aligned is India's default setting, the reliance on the US alliance is ours. But the difference is we do not have a credible plan B if our anxieties around the alliance come to fruition. In fact, what we have seen is a doubling down on doing foreign policy the way we always have. We are pursuing the unequivocal strategic alignment with the United States through AUKUS, through the freezing of the China relationship. What earlier today, the Honorable Bob Carr de described as a move from autonomy to automaticity. The lesson from India here is in the face of increased destabilization of our region, we should not simply rely on what has always worked for us in the past and may need to develop new paradigms of navigating the geopolitical instability in our region. Importantly here I'd note, the change in India of non-alignment hasn't been rhetorical, but rather a functional one. When we think about Australian autonomy in the alliance, it is less about a change in rhetoric or a change in a commitment to the alliance, and more about quietly coming up with a plan B in the background. Now this plan B, it doesn't have to be synonymous with accepting chi the Chinese challenge in our region. I'm always nervous talking about the alliance relationship. As I feel in the contemporary discussion, we've lost the space for nuance um, or, or questioning of the reliability of the US as an alliance partner. The Hugh White uh, discussion and response to that is, a, is an example. The mainstream debate has polarized. It seems that if we question the reliability, the corollary is that we must accept Chinese hegemony in the region. I think it's important to move past this polarized framing and hold space for a third conceptualization um, that isn't limited to the China-US battle for the Indo-Pacific. India is an example of a country that doesn't rely on alliances, but also doesn't accept China, the China challenge in the Indo-Pacific. It has resisted G2 framing and instead found a third way of thinking about its place in the Indo-Pacific. Along with Europe, India has embraced the notion of multipolarity. For India, embracing multipolarity looks like intensifying engagement with Southeast Asia through its Act East policy. It looks like increasing economic ties with Europe through the undertaking of FTA. And it looks like lobbying for a position on the Security Council. In contrast, Australia has not eschewed a G2 framing of the world, and in fact, it has doubled down on it. Canberra has abandoned the previous policy of strategic ambiguity, as we've discussed today, which was useful in bolstering our middle power diplomacy. Or our go-to refrain about the rules-based order, which is underwritten by US primacy in the region, is another example of that. Now, our Referring to rules-based order, it makes sense. It's our plan A, and US leadership in the region is in Australia's interest. But the point I'm trying to make here is about entertaining the possibility that the US's role in the region may not always underwrite the rules-based order. What then? Does this automatically mean Chinese leadership will replace America's, or is there a third way?
The takeaway here is that we should hold space in our foreign policy imagining for this alternative conception of a G2 Indo-Pacific. Of course, for countries like India, it's much more easier to keep that space because India has the potential to be a great power in its own right. As a middle power, the task of embracing multipolarity is more difficult, but not impossible. In fact, today, all the speakers have posited three different ways we could do that. Uh, we heard from Professor Thakur about re-embracing uh, middle power identity and investing in the multilateral institutions like the UN. Uh, we heard um, from Professor Zhu about new mini minilaterals, um, whether you want to call it a new, an Asian NATO or new minilateral security arrangements. That's another uh, model of creating a third um, axis in the Indo-Pacific. We've also discussed um, pr the potential of nuclear power or as Professor Peter Dean had, had talked about, um, thinking about an imaginative view of our defense posture, our sovereign capabilities and our military strategies. The next MacArthur conference should be focused on these topics that we've raised today and as a backup plan or as a third way to counter this insecurity we feel around the alliance. My last lesson um, from India uh, is about how our, our, we think about our strategic imaginations and how it resonates with the emerging foreign policy leaders. So last year, the Observer Research Foundation released a paper on young India and the world, similar to our Lowy poll. Um, interestingly, it found that 62% of young Indians surveyed were of the view that India should abandon non-alignment in the case of rising US-China tensions. It struck me that this is reflective of their evolving uh, foreign policy. Now, this view of young Indians is markedly different to the view of the older generations in India who held non-alignment dear and arguably were reflexively anti-American, either in fear of jeopardizing the Russian relationship or as a post-colonial hang-up. So why is this relevant to the musings on Australia? Well, as Dr. Chubb said, foreign policy should reflect our national character. And as generations emerge, they play a larger role in, in, in shaping our national character. While when it comes to Australia's emerging view on the alliance, um, young Australians' emerging views, I'd make three observations. While overall polling in Australia shows support for the alliance, the latest Lowy poll did find a significant generational divide. Australians under 30 are less likely to trust the United States and more likely to believe the alliance is less important because the United States is in decline. Now, Dr. Chubb mentioned that this may not have longevity. It, it could be a life cycle uh, force as opposed to one that will live with this generation um, into their old age. But I would note that the latest census data shows that the millennial generation is becoming the nation's largest, displacing the post-war baby boomers. This means for at least in this point in time, at this point in the life cycle, the salience of their views on the alliance matters. From my own personal experience, I came of age in the late 90s and early 2000s and have a very different view. Unlike the generation before me, um, I have not seen the US lead during a time of unprecedented economic growth and relative stability. Rather, I grew up on the war on terror, the global financial crisis, and President Trump. My second observation would be, there seems to be a tension um, in our foreign policy between an increased willingness to identify increasingly as more Asian while doubling down or retreating to the Anglosphere. Caroline, Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, in her introductory video this week, you know, roused solidarity for um, the alliance by appealing to the fact that, and I quote, our parents and grandparents fought side by side for more than 100 years. Mine didn't. And for a growing... <laughs> did fight with the British, but not the Americans. Uh, and for a growing proportion of Australians, this has also not been their experience. Indians moving to Australia were the largest overseas migrant cohort in the past decade and have supplanted China as the second biggest diaspora living in Australia. Of course, becoming more Asian doesn't mean becoming more accepting of Chinese influence in the region. China awareness is inherent part of being Asian. Nor does it mean, as Dr. Chubbs noted, declining support for the alliance. But what it does mean is that the growing, the 
growing proportion of Australians who do support Sorry, so it does mean that support for the alliance isn't based on enduring values from our, inherited from our grandparents, but from pragmatic self-interest. Which brings me to my third reflection around generational change in the alliance. My generation is increasingly interest-based rather than values-based. We see that in how identity culture plays out on social issues. Importantly, the youth of today avoid binaries. This isn't just relevant to how we talk about gender, but also how we talk about great power competition. What this means is the emerging generation of foreign, foreign policy thinkers are more capable of identifying a third way to the G2 conception of the world. The Australia-US alliance will be different for the next generation. There will be a reassessment of what Australia does, how it operates, and who it directly engages with. And the millennial generation will be shaping that. So these three lessons that we've touched on today, I see them not as having implications for autonomy from the Alliance, but autonomy within the Alliance. Having a backup, backup plan B in case the US's role in the region doesn't materialise the way we want it to, does not mean we need to back away from the Alliance at all. Thinking of Australia's role in a non-G2 world order in our neighbourhood won't change the fact that US leadership underpins underpinning a rules-based order is our ideal scenario. I'd like to draw one final pragmatic lesson from India's approach to foreign policy. The lesson lies in that infuriating Indian mentality of being doggedly and unashamedly self-interested in strategic affairs, knowing their value, throwing their weight around to strategically position themselves, however difficult it might make life for their partners. India's refusal to condemn Russia, despite pressure from the Quad, is a case in point. However, in order for Australia to do this, we need to project a confident personality into the world. As we discussed today, foreign policy is the projection of our identity on the world stage. In preparation for talking to you today, I, I talked to many of my seniors, um, and they spoke with pride about how Australia is the US's favourite ally, how central we are to Washington's Indo-Pacific strategy, how much influence we have in Washington. It was almost, I got the sense, that we should be grateful for just being there. Some suggested, in not so many words, and I've heard it repeated today, that all we have to offer our region is our relationship with the United States, that it's the only reason um, our neighbours take us seriously that without the alliance, we would have nothing to offer the Indo-Pacific. That may have been true in the past, but I resist that characterization today. As Lieutenant General Sanderson noted, we can draw confidence from a variety of areas about our place and role in the region. Firstly, from our natural resources, our iron ore and critical mineral reserves. Secondly, we're valuable to our region because we have the potential to be a clean energy superpower in hydrogen and solar and be a part of the Indo-Pacific's decarbonisation agenda. And lastly, we are valuable because through our superannuation system, we have the fourth largest capital reserves in the world, which could be a part of the Indo-Pacific's development story. For these reasons, we can project a confident personality, not just to the Indo-Pacific, but within the alliance. That means taking a leaf out of, the, of India's foreign policy playbook, becoming more self-interested, less scared, and a more difficult alliance partner. So what should we be asking for? Well, things like stepping up in the Indian Ocean, whether it's the use of HMAS Sterling or our, our Western Australian outposts, um, in the next, including them in the next force posture review, whether it's bringing in Indonesia. Indonesia is not in any trilateral or regionally relevant unilateral structure, and the US has a role in bringing Indonesia to the table um, and working with Australia on that. Secondly, we can ask for the US to give us more control of the development of our critical minerals industry. We need American investment to be able to develop this as a sovereign capability. Thirdly, we need the US to re-engage economically in the region. The Indo-Pacific framework is a pretense of economic engagement, and we haven't seen any real indication that the US is, ser is serious about engaging economically in the Indo-Pacific. Fourthly, AUKUS has established a process for technology transfer, and now we need that to come to fruition. Whether it is in AI, hypersonics, quantum, we need to be ensuring that the potential of the non-submarine aspects of AUKUS materialize. And we're not just happy with the photo opportunity. On AUKUS, 
we need to be asking the US to play a role in the short term submarine capability gap as we wait for the nuclear submarines to eventuate. And lastly, we need the US to help us have a conversation with China. The Chinese are extending a bitter hand and the US will have an important role in restarting high level ministerial diplomatic conversations. Thank you for a very stimulating and thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure you've kept us all awake in the final session, both of you. Thanks for your terrific presentations. So we do have some time now for questions. Um, so yes, if you, if you want to um, indicate your interest in, in asking a question and then perhaps come over to the microphone. Yes, thank you. And then I guess we'll come over this way after. Thank you very much uh, to both speakers. Really great to hear both presentations. This is what strikes me. Over the past decade, against common sense, against geopolitical realities, against Australia's own history and its strategic interests, as well as its economic interests, we've been captured by a pro US, uh, by pro US interests in our media, in our think tanks like ASPE, which I'm sorry to say is a joke. And I supported the creation of ASPE some 20 odd years ago. Um, I don't have any respect for that body whatsoever anymore. Um, but it isn't the only think tank that you know, is displaying these overt biases and this joined at the hip mentality with the US. Now that also feeds into our bureaucracy, which I believe has become very pro-US. And I'm talking about defense and foreign affairs here. So um, they've, they've been responsible for creating a very simplistic binary in the region and reducing Australia down to a, a really pitiful uh, reliance or, or alleged reliance on the United States when we have no guarantee whatsoever that the United States actually will really care about us. So my question is this. Um, we've been captured by these interests. What will it take for Australia to grow a spine and to transcend the, the tremendous influence that these interests have uh, gained the upper hand in, in Australia now for around a decade or so, because it concerns me. It affects our democracy apart from anything else. Thank you. Thank you for that question, but I feel like it's not really <laughs> directed to me, but I, I will still say something, you know. Uh, I haven't been here for long, but I heard that, uh, you know, in Australia we have two uh, major think tanks, right, Lowy and uh, APRI, right? Uh, well, I mean, people sp speak highly of uh, Lowy, but uh, APRI, you know, of course, you know, is supported by uh, this military industrial complex. Uh, so, uh, and I read some of the stuff they publish, and obviously uh, not quite objective, to say the least, right? So, I mean, that's, uh, I don't know how to uh, solve that problem. Uh, another issue you raised, how, how Australians can grow their spine. I mean, I hate to offer any <laughs> uh, suggestion here to my Australian friends, but I think, as I said in my remarks, you know, yes, I, I strongly support U.S. Uh, Australia uh, Alliance, I mean, there's no doubt about it. You know, this is a, a pillar of US, uh, Australian foreign policy. But again, I don't think, you know, even from a historical perspective, that uh, the two countries always share the same uh, interests. So uh, for Australia to, uh, uh, to maintain some autonomy and distance uh, from US policies, I think makes sense, especially uh, if it's in, US, uh, in Australia interests. I think uh, definitely uh, Australia should, you know, stand up to say no. Um, and uh, 
uh, develop uh, policies uh, in its, its own best interest. Uh, but that's just, just a general comment. Thank you very much. I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, Sonia used a terrific expre expression, and I wanted to get this on the record. It was what I was trying to say this morning. She spoke about, and it's a great phrase to settle on, autonomy within the alliance. We accept the polling, and we accept the 100 years of Australian history in which since the early 19th century we've been seeking a large and powerful friend, Australia's natural position is to seek an ally. But what Sonia put so well is this notion of why can't we maintain our own character while working in partnership with an, with an ally? And that's what we've surrendered. That's what we've lost. The capacity to have some independence within the alliance. That's been foregone. I, right now, if someone proposed, a foreign minister proposed the Cambodian peace process leading to the, the pa Cambodian peace agreement, which Gareth Evans had taken up, the state of the bureaucracy in Canberra would be, we'd better run this past Washington. We'd better check this with the Americans. That's the condition we've reached. I doubt today that we would pursue the small arms treaty because Republicans in America wouldn't like it, given their relationship with the National Rifle Association. A, a treaty to mop up small arms around the world is antith antithetical to the whole ethos of the National Rifle Association. We've lost any notion of independence, yes, within the alliance. Autonomy, as Sonia says, within the alliance. And she urged us to be less scared. Here's something I want to share with you. I've reached the view that what we saw in Australia from 2017 with stories being leaked, invented, fabricated, was nothing less than parts of the Canberra establishment managing a China panic. I'll give you three very quick examples. I won't take a minute. The census site comes down a few years ago. Peter Jennings of Aspie is on the media saying the Chinese did this, it's the way they work, this is cyber. The federal government came out and said no, a lorry was parked in front of a key facility and the site just came down. Why would Peter Jennings, the head of ASPE, a serious government funded, an armaments company funded think tank, rush to the media and say the Chinese did it? I'll give you another example. Um, out of the blue, front page story in nine media newspapers and running on TV, the Chinese are investing in a port, in a wharf in Port Vila this is going to be a naval base. Aspie came out and confirmed this was a terribly concerning development, so did other um, anti-China agitators in the academic world. It ran for a week in our media, headlines in nine media, 60 minutes, <laughs> TV news. Malcolm Turnbull himself at a Commonwealth minister's, a Commonwealth summit in London, standing next to the then Prime Minister Vanuatu, said, there's no truth in this. They are, after all, a member of the non-aligned movement. They've never heard of a notion of a Chinese base. We believe, Canberra believes, this is nonsense. I'll give you another example. A, an ordinary member of the New South Wales Parliament had his home raided by ASIO. The implication, ASIO got the message out, was that he was running pro-Chinese tweets and, and commentary. That was two and a half years ago. They occupied his home for 24 hours, two shifts, the federal police in Asia, they dusted the tyres of his car as if he were a cocaine importer. Two and a half years on, not a charge against him or his Chinese background staffer working for him one day a week. It was a panic. It was on TV, it was on radio, the front pages of the newspaper because the media were invited in. A fourth example, very quick, uh, a public servant in Canberra called Uren used to work for the Office of National Assessment. When Four Corners produced in 2017 a program about Chinese influence in Australia, this was presented, could only have come from ASIO, as a major example 
of Chinese espionage. He was facing, he'd been facing for five years, he was facing charges. Without any media attention, because it turned out to be very little of the story, he was taken to court. The revelation in the end was he had a document of no importance from the files of ONA, formally stamped for Australian eyes only, but of no security implication. He was fined $150. Now, this, the whole thing was a joke. It had been presented to Four Corners and was presented, said to have been a serious example of Chinese espionage. Now, I could go on, but I won't. ACRI produced a publication on China Panic. From 2017, orchestrated in the media, there was media management. One senior editor, Max Such, who ended up writing three articles in the Financial Review about the tilt against China in our foreign policy, said this, and I quote, a former editor of the National Times and the Australian Financial Review. He said, he has witnessed media campaigns before in his life. He had seen, he'd seen how embassies had used the media. He said he thought the China panic stories generated in the media in 2017 and beyond were unique. He said, in the last three years, I'm quoting him, there's been a superb influencing on the Australian media. As an old journalist, I was struck by how effective it was, how well done it was. And I think that should concern us. In the end, the government's foreign influence legislation, designed to yield examples of Chinese intervention in Australian politics, in place now for four, four and a half years, has produced not a single example of Chinese influence at work. But what we've seen demonstrated is influence coming from someone manipulating the media and producing a raft of China panic stories from mid-2017. Without being told what to do by agents of the Chinese Communist Party or by people in the Chinese embassy or by anyone else, Chinese background voters in the last federal election decided they didn't like the language, the panic language, the war talk of the federal government, and they opted as naturalised Australians to vote against the coalition in key subdivisions where there were large representations of Chinese voters, the vote for Labor spiked and there is no doubt Chinese background voters were extremely uncomfortable with war talk, war is inevitable, let's prepare for war, the drums of war are sounding rhetoric. And they did it without urging from anyone, they did it by exercising their right as Australian voters. Um, hi, uh, Tao from UMA again. Um, I just um, have a question that, um, you know, last month, Australia uh, was invited to attend NATO summit in Spain, historically because Australia never really, you know, officially invited to that event, along with South Korea, which is also quite historical. Um, and after the, the summit, like, you know, people started talking about, you know, the possible, um, uh, a new, like, you know, uh, a new NATO-like alliance in Asia, Pacific region. Uh, like, you know, do you think that that's kind of like, you know, the, the direction we're heading to, like what's the, you know, uh, the implications to Australia and, the, you know, the, to our regions, which is already <laughs> seriously contested, you know, hated. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really early to, to determine, like, you know, the, the Australia's new, like, you know, government's foreign policy towards China because people failed to anticipate, like, you know, John Biden's, you know, China's policy after he was elected. And uh, now we can see, like, in the, pretty much like doing the similar things what Trump did, like you know, um, towards China. Um, but um, yeah, plus that's that's the thing like I observe. And is there is any possibility of having the new, like you know, NATO-like you know, small lines, which may include Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Korea, and Japan. Thank you. <laughs> 
Let me, just, let me just say I enjoyed this last session enormously and thank you both very much for your presentations. I, I have discussions with my grandchildren uh, like Sonia put before us and they, they're very confronting the, the whole mob of them. So uh, if young, young people in Australia are thinking like that, we're on a very good path. So uh, I'm very pleased about it. But uh, Josh and I, I, I wanted to make a comment on your presentation because I, I thought it was very constructive and enjoyable. But the thing that really worries in this, in this country is the one-party state. I mean, it would be very simple if we were a one-party state and they had a meeting in the party room on Wednesday and they said, next week we're all going to love China. OK, sign up, everybody sign up and away we go. doesn't work like that. Uh, we've had some nasty experiences with one-party states. Uh, one-party states sometimes fall into the hands of people, uh, of individuals who are in the business of... Uh, empowering themselves within the whole system and, and do things uh, which, uh, you know, has a devastating effect on the rest of the world. I mean, Hitler and Mussolini ran a one-party state. It was a socialist party, actually. They call themselves national socialists, but, you know, it was very national, extreme nationalism, OK? Um, it would be very worrying if China ended up with an extreme nationalism state. And we do need some sort of guarantees that uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, and if it did happen, that there would at least be some elements within China that would oppose it. Uh, and we're not seeing any visibility of any such thing. So, you know, uh, Huawei, uh, I, you know, I, I was deeply concerned about that decision because I thought it was actually a very good option for us. But the fact of the matter is, how closely were they linked to this one-party state? And would the long-term implications of that be to the detriment uh, of our liberty as a, as a nation? So I would like your views on that, OK? From Philadelphia, or Pennsylvania, I should say. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. I'll just jump in before I hand over this um, stage. So to the first question, I, I think it's important to recognise that for Australia's national interest, a rules-based order under US leadership is the best thing for us and that it isn't actually a choice um, that we have to make between the two great powers in our region. Even if you aren't convinced um, from a values perspective about democracy, authoritarianism, all the other um, you know, big emotional words, then purely from an opportunity cost of how much we have invested as a nation since federation in the in the alliance. So I, I think that's an important um, point to the first question um, that you asked. Um, secondly, in, in terms of autonomy within the alliance, I think there's a really good example in Israel of how much space we have. Israel, without the blessing of the US, developed its own nuclear weapons, but it continues to be an ally. Now, I'm not suggesting we should do that, but I'm, I'm showing a model of autonomy within the alliance that other US alliance partners um, have gone down and hasn't resulted in the complete breakdown of the relationship. Um, I also think um, in terms of the panic we've been talking about, it's deeply subconscious and goes to Professor Zhu's point around um, our, our avoidance of the enemies within and our preference to find enemies without and the coalescing factor that um, a big bad enemy, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's authoritarianism, has um, internally. Um, in terms of the Asian NATO, um, I did talk to Professor Dean about this and he told me it was a terrible idea because um, uh, of the nature and differences of the kind of defence postures in Southeast Asia, also the fact that um, it's a, it's a you know, maritime NATO as opposed to a continental one like in Europe. So there's, there's some questions around that. But what he did suggest um, in lieu of an Asian NATO was new minilateral um, security formations. So we have many minilaterals, but we haven't got formalised them in a security sense. And so 
that could be um, the solution instead. Um, and this goes back to my Indonesia point and the importance of bringing Indonesia in onto these conversations. So many years ago, um, the idea of Indonesia, US, India trilaterals was mooted, um, but that has, sorry, Australia, Indonesia, US trilaterals were mooted and never came to fruition. That's the kind of thing that we can ask from our alliance, from the US, to, be, to help us develop or move towards those minilateral security settings. Finally, I know Professor Zhu, you're coming up to um, answer the question that the general put to you. I'd also just wanted to push back on your characterization of India um, in the Singapore model. You said there was Japan and there was Singapore. I, I would say India is more the Japan model. Um, and though there's BRICS and though there's the Shanghai Development Corporation, um, the reaction to the Galwan Valley through the regulations around foreign direct investment into India, the similar to Huawei uh, constraints on uh, technology coming into India, apps like TikTok and Hawaii in, in India following 2020 is another example of that. The third example of that is the increased mil militarization of the borders. So um, I'd be interested to hear what you think. My only comment on India was that it wasn't included in the NATO conference. Yeah, yeah. So all these other people were. Yeah, yeah. So first, uh, NATO. Uh, I mean, I, I think NATO expansion to uh, to Asia or or linking NATO to some sort of uh, uh, Asian uh, uh, security group is a bad idea. You know, it's uh, unnecessarily confrontational. Uh, I'm not sure you know, how many countries uh, in Asia will, will actually be interested in joining, perhaps except Japan. I, I don't think uh, <laughs> Australia necessarily wants to be part of it. And in South Korea, you know, they, 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 it's very controversial, you know. Um, Southeast Asia, you can bet that you know, nobody will be part of it uh, because uh, uh, South Korea, uh, I mean, uh, Southeast Asia countries, you, you realize that Southeast Asian countries uh, trade with China more than with anybody else. And uh, just like Singapore I mentioned, you know, yes, uh, I don't think uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries want to be any part of it. Uh, Sonia's question about the uh, <laughs> more. I agree. I mean, maybe India is a third model, right? Not, not just uh, between uh, Singapore and Japan. Uh, again, going back to uh, uh, my original point about uh, this, these options and diversity. You know, I, I don't. Well, I singled out Singapore because I think it's uh, compared to uh, the Japan model. I think uh, Singapore model obviously uh, uh, is more likely to lead to peace uh, than to uh, to uh, conflict. So that's why I personally prefer Singapore model, but doesn't mean that uh, that's the only <laughs> model I'm proposing. Uh, I, obviously, uh, if India model uh, works, I think, uh, yes, countries around the world, especially in the Indo-Pacific region, feel free to follow the Indian model, right? Uh, general question, <laughs> very tough, you know, one-party state. Um, I have nothing to do with it, of course, right? <laughs> uh, but it's a dilemma, of course. Uh, and uh, it has always been a one-party state. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier. You know, when when the West uh, opened uh, to China, when when the West embraced China, uh, starting from uh, the 1960s, I think France was the first Western country to establish diplomatic relations with the PRC, uh, then followed by others in Australia, Japan, United States. Right? Uh, China has always been a one-party state. Uh, if you want to change that, I don't think it's realistic, I and mean, you'd, you'd have to start a revolution, right? to overthrow that regime and introduce a multi-party system to China, but that's not going to happen. Uh, I think the uh, South China Morning Post in Hong Kong uh, last week just published an interesting article about this uh, topic. You know, the title is something like, uh, the, the CCP, uh, in, uh, it's easier for CCP to enjoy support at home than abroad, which tells us something about the CCP's popularity at home. Now, we may not uh, know that actually CCP is popular uh, within China. I mean, there are a lot of complaints, especially right now with COVID stuff, right? Dissent, you know, uh, definitely over there. But overall, you know, this, this is based on this uh, study uh, led by uh, Harvard professor uh, Anthony uh, Sarge, you know, and his team. 
uh, they followed uh, this, uh, you know, they did the field study in China uh, for a period of over 10 years, I believe, from mid 2000s to mid 2010s. Uh, over that one, uh, more than one decade, they discovered that the support of the CCP has increased over the years in China. How, how strong? Well, you'll be surprised. You want to guess how, how, how strong is the CCP support or approval rating in China? Over 90%. I mean, you can challenge, well, what kind of research are you doing, right? Well, yeah, but this is not the propaganda from Chinese. Uh, this is a research done by a series of scholars from Harvard. And, uh, and they also found, uh, interestingly, you know, the higher level of the government in China, the more support they, they got. It's the lower level of government that is believed to be corrupt, and people just hate these local officials, uh, which uh, I kind of agree. I think you know, uh, if you go to China and people talk about the corruption, but they barely talk about the top leadership. They think the top leadership is good. Right? They have this vision for China to turn China into a powerful, uh, wealthy state. That has always been the Chinese dream. Right? Not, this is not really Xi Jinping's dream. Right? Uh, wealthy and powerful, you know, that has been the Chinese dream for generations. And they think that the CCP has done a great job recently. But it's the local officials who are corrupt. That's why the local officials enjoy low support, uh, but the high level, 90%. You know. Well, you can say, well, yeah, maybe you know, something wrong with the research, but just use that as a yardstick. You know. uh, it tells us uh, a different story. You know. I'm not uh, <laughs> arguing <laughs> for, for a one-party state here, of course, right? but I, I just want to point out, you know, I think outside world will have to be realistic. You're dealing with China, okay. You're going to deal with this one-party state for a long time to come. It's not going to crumble anytime soon uh, because of its strong support at home. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, again, if we, want to, if we want to transform China, I think, it, you know, I think actually the Biden administration's policies is, is sound because mm -hmm. they, are, they are realistic now because Pompeo said we've got to do some regime change in China. But uh, President Biden said, no, no, it's not going to happen, right? We're going to shape the environment uh, in which you know, China may change its behavior, its policy. I, I support that kind of approach. I think engagement uh, is a better approach. You, know, you want to change China? Well, um, any, any, uh, any change uh, will come from within, not from uh, uh, outside. And uh, we have a long way to go. But, uh, Again, I don't think there's uh, any way to, uh, uh, to change that one-party state anytime soon. And this is perhaps <laughs> unfortunate <laughs> for, the, for other countries, especially for Western countries, you know, which emphasize uh, human rights, right, those kind of things. Uh, yes, we have to deal with that uh, reality. And uh, maybe through uh, engagement, uh, gradually, uh, China will change. I think, again, if you take a historical perspective, I think China has changed. I think uh, mostly China has changed positively. I mean, you will see up and downs. Maybe right now it's a down time, right? With, with Xi Jinping in control, you know, aggressive policies, you know, in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, right? It's a down time. But uh, uh, as they say, you know, they, they, sometimes they uh, move forward two steps, then step back one step, you know. But overall, it, it, it's moving ahead, you know. I'll, I, maybe on that point, and I'm <laughs> a little bit more uh, optimistic. Uh, maybe naive, but uh, uh, that's just me. Thank you very much. I suppose it's a comment really and I'll just um, thank um, Griffith University for a fantastic day of engagement and discussion around these really important and relevant issues. What has dominated what I've heard is you know, that we are questioning the Alliance, its history, where we're at now, and looking for greater autonomy. But I think um, what hasn't been questioned is really whether we, 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 we have benefited from this Alliance in, in, in balance with how we have um, been, been impacted negatively. And for me, as a peace activist, um, over the last 70, seven years, I see the wars that we've engaged in and the deaths of millions of people as a result of wars that were nothing about the defence of Australia. So that's my sort of lasting word, but 
I think the more we get this talked about, the better. So it's been great. Thank you very much.